Well, friends, happy Australia Day. I hope that uh, I hope there, there was a little bit of uh, Aussie fun, and uh, we're going to continue that afterwards at our barbecue. But today, in the time that we have, I would love to preach a little bit about our wonderful nation. Uh, welcome today, Fraser Harding, Pastor Fraser Harding. He's uh, uh, for those of you who haven't had the opportunity to yet meet Pastor Fraser Harding, he was the founder of Good News for Israel, uh, which, is, which he handed over uh, after deliberation, prayer, and time of running that season to uh, my father, Pastor Greg Cumming, and birthed, therefore, Kingdom Church. And so, uh, so <clears throat> I, I think, Fraser, you are like our, uh, our grandfather, Kingdom Church's grandfather. And so we honour you today. We hope you can stick around. And if you get a chance, talk to this wonderful man about the journeys and adventures he had. I had the blessing of meeting Fraser in Israel. Uh, and he was one of my, the tour operators at the time. And I remember sitting there like a little child, learning from uh, a great man. So... If you, if you have your Bibles today, uh, get them ready because we're going to be looking at the Scriptures. Today I'm speaking on Australia, our past, our present and our future. And uh, I thought I might start while you're getting your Bibles ready but with just a couple of Australian jokes. A British man was visiting Australia <clears throat> and he came to the customs agent. And the customs agent said, have you got any criminal record? And the British man said, I didn't think I needed one of those to get into Australia anymore. <laughs> boom, boom. Kurt, if it takes an IQ of 60 to tie shoelaces, why do so many of us wear thongs? <laughs> A devout religious Australian cowboy from Kingdom Church lost his favourite Bible while he was mending fences out on the range. His name was James Morrissey. Three weeks later, a kangaroo walked up to him carrying the Bible that he'd lost in his mouth. The cowboy couldn't believe his eyes. He took the precious book out of the kangaroo's mouth and he raised his eyes heavenward and he exclaimed, It's a miracle! Not really, the kangaroo said. Your name's written on the inside of the cover. <laughs> I want to talk today about Australia. And Australia Day is the official national day that Australia commemorates the arrival of the first, uh, first fleet in the Cove of Sydney, 1788. I want to note, there were some wonderful people beforehand. The Aboriginals, the Indigenous people of Australia, when they came from Guinea and others from Africa and formed our nation. So when we're talking about Australia Day, we're talking about the colonisation and people from all nations gathering and setting a religious, spiritual standard in our nation. But we need to see our past to recognise our present and our future. And to do that, we're going to go into some scriptures. Daniel 7, verses 13. If you've got your Bibles, please open to it. Daniel 7. And behold, one like the Son of Man, Daniel 7, 13, coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days and brought him before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom, that all people, that all nations and all languages should serve him. His dominion is everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. So in the vision of Daniel, when he says all nations, does that include Australia? It absolutely does. So back in the prophecy that God's giving Daniel, he's looking forward at Australia and saying the kingdom will reign and the languages of Australia and the languages to the ends of the earth will celebrate the King of Kings. Jeremiah 3.17, at that time Jerusalem shall be called the throne of God and all nations shall be gathered to it. To the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem, no more shall they follow the dictates of their evil heart. Australia is one of those nations. When you look at the Old Testament and you see the prophecies and you see the word nations there and you see the words to the end of the earth, we are about as far as the end of the earth goes. Unless you're an Eskimo in the, in, in the South, Pole, South Pole, and I'm pretty sure they're the North, so forget I said anything there. <laughs> but it's pretty far as, I mean, there's one nation further, and that's New Zealand. That's probably as far as the end of the world goes, to the end of the world. Australia has a Christian, massive Christian history. Did I hear an amen there from Jeff Calder? Is that what you said there? <laughs> you know, it goes about 2,000 years, and you start back at this incredible guy who's the son of of man who's the king of kings and is the lord of lords and his name is jesus matthew 28 
He's there gathered with the 11 disciples. Matthew 28, 16 to 20. And to the mount of which Jesus had appointed them, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Jesus came to them and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me on heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, Australia, New Zealand, and everywhere else. And lo, I'm with you to the end of the age. And then something interesting happened not long after that point. We've been talking about it the last couple of weeks as we've been exploring the gifts of the Spirit. Jesus said to them, the disciples, wait, I'm going to send to you a helper. We know his name. It's the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8. Being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to part from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. You've heard from me for John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him and said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. The power of the Holy Spirit was the qualifier and the sign that the disciples and men and women for all around the world would start to explore the ends of the earth. They explored, didn't they, didn't they, David, Pastor David? They went to Latin America. They explored and they went to countries in Australia. They went to New Zealand. They went to Guinea. The explorers in their, in their mighty courage, holding with them a Bible in one hand, and some kind of monoscope in the other to kind of see where they were going on the ships that they were on or whether they crossed by land. Their goal was to take this mighty gospel that Jesus had commissioned with courage and boldness to every nation and to every person. And so they were sent by the Holy Spirit. But why was that important? John 14 gives us a picture. John 14 verses 16 says, And I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. And you know him, for he dwells with you. I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. So as we explore this morning, every single person who went out to the world, they were empowered with not only the truth of the scripture, but they had this wonderful Holy Spirit to lead and guide them. And sometimes, as Rod said a bit earlier, it didn't come sitting in the garden with butterflies and birds, but it came through deliberation, where the Lord would speak to them in the middle of the night with a dream or a vision or in a time of prayer where they were seeking the Lord, just as we do, where we seek the Lord to find out what he's saying. So Acts 2 verses 1 to 4 happens, the day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost had finally come, they were with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound of heaven. We read this last week. It was the mighty sound of a rushing wind. And on this day of Pentecost, like the day of Pentecost at Sinai, fire was seen coming down upon the heads of people. I want you to imagine this for a moment. Imagine fire at this moment coming down and resting on heads. It wouldn't be something we would just sit down and go, oh, that's nice. We look at this in amazement and wonder at our God and say, what is this? What is this spirit? Is there nothing that we cannot do? And the first thing that happened empowered by the Spirit is Peter, who we know wasn't necessarily the most eloquent guy. He gets up and he starts to speak truth and he starts to speak the gospel and he starts to speak of this Messiah who was crucified, who was resurrected. And what happens? 3,000 people on that very day give their heart to following Jesus. Isn't that amazing? That before, no other revival happens like that, but yet in that moment, empowered by the Holy Spirit, people's lives start to change. So the gospel spreads. And so what happened to these wonderful disciples? Let's look at their lives because it gets even better. (laughs) As tradition has it, Peter eventually went to Rome. What happened in Rome? He preached and then he was crucified upside down. Peter's brother Andrew went to Greece. Can you guess what happened to him? He was crucified on an X-shaped cross. James took the gospel to Spain but was later slain by the order of Herod Agrippa. John preached around Jerusalem and he was finally exiled to Patmos where he had the vision of, of revelation and wrote it. Thomas took the gospel to India. Bartholomew was flayed and crucified on a trip to India. James the younger was stoned to death while he worked among the Jews. The point is not so much about the death, but that these men of God went conviction in their heart and in the power of the Holy Spirit, they went. 
See, when the Holy Spirit does something inside your heart and in my heart, it's not death that's our concern, but it's the hope for the future glory that we might take as many people with us into eternity. When you have that courage in the way that they saw the world, there's no one that you would not reach. Are you hearing me this morning? And so these men did that. So following on from that, that fire that was in their hearts, we have some people in history that I want to talk about. The first person that we know of was a Dutch explorer named William Janes, and King Philip III spoke to him with this commission, that no time be lost in discovering that Australia, a region so far unknown, so that the people may have the knowledge of the gospel and be brought into spiritual obedience. 1606. Isn't that incredible? That even that, back that far, that the gospel would come to our nation and spiritual obedience would follow. Spiritual obedience. Following on from that, we had Fernandez de Quiros, and he was a man of faith with great missionary zeal. And he said this, or what was said about him, from his youth he seemed to have been caught up with missionary enthusiasm of the age. He was gentle in spirit, one of God's chosen vessels like you and me. For de Quiros, all men were adopted children of God, and he began to believe that he had been singled out by God as a vessel through the, the, the inhabitants of Terrace Australis would know and receive God and be dedicated this land, and he dedicated this land and the ones around it as the southern lands of the Holy Spirit. Can I read you what he said? Thank you, by the way, for that. Let the heavens, the earth, the waters with all the creatures and all those here present witness that I, Captain Pedro Fernandes de Quiros, he said this in Portuguese, not in English, uh, not in Aussie English either. He said in Portuguese most likely. In the name of Jesus Christ, Hoist this emblem of the Holy Cross on which Jesus Christ's person was crucified and whereon he gave his life for the ransom and the remedy of the, of the human race. On which day did he make this statement, by the way? On the day of Pentecost, 14th of May, 1606. I take possession of all of this part of the south as far as the pole in the name of Jesus, from which now shall be called the southern lands of the Holy Spirit. And this always and forever to the end that all natives in all the said lands, the holy sacred gospel may be preached zealously and openly. What a statement to make. You know, once you make a statement, a prophetic statement, Lord forbid anyone try and change that. If the first explorer, one of the first explorers says that this is the great south land of the Holy Spirit, and that is to come under the spiritual obedience of God Almighty. If a politician says that this is not a Christian nation, what will you say? See ya. I like that, David. See ya. Did you find Australia? No, you did not. <laughs> Were you speaking prophetically? No, you did not. See, see when people fill out stat statistics and say they're Christian or not Christian, do they speak on behalf of God? No, they do not. I remember another man in history in the Old Testament, he tried to take up a census to see what the people thought and how the people numbered. And his name was David. And you know what happened? The Lord rebuked him. Why? Because no census is ever going to tell the king of a nation, the politicians of a nation, the people of a nation that we're not a nation of God. No one will say that except the king himself. And so where Fernandez de Quiros prophesied that this is the great south land of the Holy Spirit and all the nations surrounding it, so it shall be. You step into this nation and get citizenship. You are a son to the word that you, are, you, are, you will be possessed by the Holy Spirit in the most wonderful ways. That you will operate by the Holy Spirit and come into spiritual obedience. That is the prophecy of this nation. So if someone says to you, and our, our politicians may sometimes say to you that this is not a Christian nation, I tell you what, don't believe a word they say. They do not carry the authority of mighty God to say what this nation is or is not, but God himself. Following on, we had many other explorers come and take this land or look at this land. In 1770, Captain James Cook annexed both the North and South Islands of New Zealand. Hurrah, Jeff discovered the east coast of Australia and through the Great Barrier Reef opposite Queensland hoisted the British flag and possession of the island of Cape York claiming that the whole of the eastern coast belonged then to Britain. And it's no later than that very moment forward that British common law began to operate. Why is it important that British common law began to operate? I want to tell you is that Our Majesty the Queen was presented with a Bible. I want to talk to you about this, this quote to her. 
to keep your majesty ever mindful of the law and of the gospel. This is what, it, this is what was presented to you, of the law and of the gospel of God. As the rule for the whole life and government of Christian princes, we present you with this book, the most valuable thing this world affords. Here is wisdom. This is the royal law. These are the living oracles of God. When the orb was delivered to the queen in the coronation service, it was stated, receive this orb set under the cross and remember that the whole world is subject to the power and the empire of Christ our Redeemer. Don't you think that's powerful? Don't you think that's, I think that's incredibly powerful that our queen, or at least the queen at the time, received this. And it was recognised that there was no higher authority and when we think of our nation, when you think of your nation, do you see it in the same light that this very thing that you hold in your hand is the highest authority? It is special. It's wonderful. Queensland was enjoyed in 1859. Queen Victoria established the great state and named it after herself. It's our further will and pleasure that you, the utmost of your power, promote religion and education among the native inhabitants of our said colony, or the lands and the islands thereto adjoining, and that you especially take care to protect them and their persons in the free enjoyment of their possessions, and that you do by all lawful means prevent and restrain from all violence, injustice, which may be in the manner be practiced to attempt against them, and that you take such measure as may appear to you to be necessary for their conversion to the Christian faith. Is there any doubt that in our forefathers' mind they were here to achieve a mission? They were here to see people saved. They were there by the power of the Holy Spirit. And just because we inhabit the land now doesn't mean the mission has changed. The mission has never changed from going and taking the land and seeing that all people receive Jesus. The mission has not changed. But the workers have become many. But when the workers become many, so comes the apathy in the thought that someone else has this. I'm trying to communicate to you today that the Holy Spirit in each one of us has a great commission and that commission has not stopped. We now are local inhabitants of this land. God wants to see every child of son and daughter of Australia saved. So the Holy Spirit then picks the first Christian minister in Australia. The first Christian minister came with the, uh, the first fleet. His name was Reverend Johnson, Reverend Richard Johnson, and he was recommended by the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel. Johnson took with him many Bibles, and he started to uh, books of common prayer, and he started chaplaincy. Reverend Richard Johnson. Isn't it amazing that our nation, when you go and see schools today, you hear terms like Scripture Union and the Bible Society, and that in every aspect of a school, state or, or, or private, there's usually a chaplain. Why? Because a man named Reverend Richard Johnson saw in his heart to start chaplaincy. Isn't that great? The first schools in Australia were Christian schools. It wasn't until 50 years later that we had state schools arrive on the scene. Our flag, I don't know if there's another one there, but it's a Christian flag. It's got four crosses on it, including the Great Southern Cross. <laughs> That's a good it's got the Union Jack, England, Ireland and Wales on there and the crosses. And then, of course, the... Sorry? Upside down? Oh, there you go. On my side, it's the right way up. And then, of course, the Great Southern Cross, which have, it, it's been said that the star at the north is the brightest red star that can be seen in any night sky. Isn't that incredible? That our flag beholds the name of Jesus even in it. Thanks for that, Kelly. And so we have many people in our history that have been great men and women of God. You only need to look at any influential leader and in any influential leader you start to see the hallmark of Christianity, the hallmark of faith in Messiah. You see, Australia is Jesus' nation. I mentioned this earlier, let no other person tell you otherwise. He's our history. He's in our constitution. Did you know that during the, 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 constant, or during the times of common law, New South Wales, it, we opened parliament with a prayer. Did you know that that's how our, our lawyers, lawmakers open their meetings? Now, after that, it just seems to get a little bit washy sometimes, but that's how the meetings are opened. There is no doubt that God is in our nation. No doubt. Christians of Australia can rejoice of the contributions. We can rejoice that our forefathers were so strong on this point that Australia is a Christian nation. And, that he's, and God is sending, sending labourers to every aspect and every walk of life. So I want to talk now about the future. We have some amazing prophecies that relate to our future. Did you know that? 
Smith Wigglesworth, he prophesied this at the beginning and the turn of the 20th century, God would start to shake up Australia. I'm sure you've all heard this word. New Zealand, and by the way, it wasn't just Australia, it was New Zealand, the islands of the Pacific, with a mighty move of the Holy Spirit that would spread throughout the whole world. Just before the return of Jesus, he said that the mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit would surpass all others. Now, if that's what hallmarks revival, are we ready for it? Are you ready for it? If the Holy Spirit broke out in this room with fire on all of our heads, what would we do? Now, it would probably be Pentecost if that happened, but, but the Holy Spirit is going to do it. There's another, another prophecy in 1975 by Derek Prince, and I'll read it to you. He declared that Australia and New Zealand would be used by God at the turn of the 21st century to lead one of the greatest Christian revivals that would spread throughout the whole world, ushering the triumphant return of King Jesus and the Lord of Lords to Jerusalem. So why not us? Why not us? You know, sometimes I, I look... And I wonder at what it would take to have the Holy Spirit pour out on us. What would it take? What would it take? Here's what I think it would take. I think it would take hearts like our early explorers that said it above all cost, we will go and achieve the mission of this gospel. Fernandez de Quiros didn't go and see the nation and establish the prophetic word about the nation by sitting at home and watching Netflix. Not that he had Netflix. William Janus didn't sit at home and wait. He got off his bottom and said, if the Holy Spirit has commissioned me to do it, then I'm going to be hungry for it. There is a challenge here today to test God in each of our lives, each of our areas. Some of us here today are business owners. Some of us are fathers and mothers, brothers, sisters, students. Whatever walk of life you are in, there is an adventure that the Holy Spirit has got for you today. That you can say, yes, God, I'm going to take the challenge of this and I'm going to go full ball and take the gospel of the kingdom to wherever I am. But it takes not apathy, it takes courage. I want you to ask yourself right now, what's it going to take for me to speak the gospel to the person I see next? What's it going to take for me to pray for the first person that needs healing next? What's it going to take for me to stand up and rise up and do something for God? What's it going to take? Friends, I, I, today I believe that if we're asking for the Holy Spirit and we want to see the Holy Spirit come and flood out upon us, there has to be a passion in our hearts and a zeal in our hearts that says, Holy Spirit, come. I have this picture of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords returning. And as he comes over on his way to Jerusalem, I, I hope he bypasses Australia first. So that we say, we knew you were coming, Lord Jesus. We knew it because you were outpouring on us and we were ready for him. We knew it. But what's it going to take? I, I loved sitting with my brother, Michael. Michael Darich was telling me in his business how he recruits staff. And he has men and women from all different walks of life. He has uh, Muslims that sometimes work for him. And he has atheists that work for him. But he has a majority of Christians that work for him. And during his induction day, he puts them through a four-hour gospel presentation. Why? Because he can. He didn't start the business just to make money. He started the business so he can have an impact on the world around him. And you know what? I had the pleasure of working for Michael for a while. And he put me with a young guy who, who didn't know Jesus. He was, he was actually older than me, so he wasn't a young guy. Um, but he didn't know Jesus. And I got complete, for about 10 weeks, complete access to this one guy to speak the gospel over and over and over and over. And every Sunday, every Saturday, we would talk about the Lord and he would have his questions. And he'd say, well, what about this? And is, how can God be good of this? And, and you know, you know what? Preach the gospel. I did that because a man made a way. How will you make a way? What is it that you do that will make a way for, for God in your business, your life, your studies? I want to read you Hebrews 11 verses 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before him, before us rather. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, 
who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What the disciples and what Jesus left is now our mantle to take on. Go make disciples of all nations. That's my mandate. That's your mandate. It's time for us to stand up. I know that I can't do this alone, friends, and I know that you can't do this alone. But I know that when we stand with the Holy Spirit, we become the majority. Today is Australia Day. There's no better day to commemorate what our forefathers have done. But the best and biggest injustice that we could do would be to not carry that mantle forward. I hope today that I've conveyed to you that no matter what man says about our nation, God has spoken it and he will remain a Christian nation. No statute of law will tell me otherwise. No statute that comes in place that tries to contradict the Word of God will ever hold any place higher than the Word of God. This is a Christian nation. A Christian nation. Romans 1.16 says this, I am not ashamed of the gospel and it is the power of God to salvation for all those that believe. I'm going to invite the musicians to come. Cam, could I please invite you as well? Friends, would you join me in standing please this morning? If I said to you this morning, how many of you want to see the return of Jesus? I think we'd have a 100% quorum say, yes, we want to see the return of Jesus. If I said to you, how many of us want to see the Holy Spirit move powerfully in our midst? We would have a 100% quorum say, yes, we want him to move. If I said to you, how many of us today want to obey his word and see him moving through us? 100%. So how do we do that? We start, friends, in praying for our nation that God would do something. We're going to invite you today. Cam is going to be leading us in prayer. I'm go we're going to be inviting people to come up and pray as well for our nation. I please, this morning, I don't want you to hesitate. This mic's going to be open as we pray for our nation. If you've got something in your heart, a prophetic word, something that you'd like to say about our nation, be bold this morning and come and pray it out. I'm going to leave it to Cam and then let's pray. Friends, there are times for us, by the way, to be relaxed and silent. This is not one of them. If you speak in tongues, speak in tongues. If you have something to shout out, shout it out. Don't be silent.